early March, yeah, on, on the 6th of March. So February, I didn't leave and I was supposed to go out on February, but I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm stuck for the past six months now, <laughs> like everybody else. <laughs> My wife doesn't recognize me anymore because she's used to me leave flying everywhere like 70 days a year. She says, why well, yeah, you haven't left in <laughs> making fun of me that, you know, I'm, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to be home for a while. I know you discover new dimensions of yourself. <laughs> You discover a new life, and there are people who are welcoming you, you know, <laughs> and yeah. not asking you for, for, for medical advice. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Nasr. Hello. Hello, everybody. Jack, how are you, my friend? We are happy Ahla. to have you with us. <laughs> Thank you, Nasr. Professor al uh, I'm very happy and honored uh, to uh, join us in this webinar. I don't know if Muhammad Fuad, Dr. Muhammad Fuad Dash is here, the moderator. Yeah, 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 I'm here, bro. Muhammad? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Welcome, Omar, uh, who is helping uh, me on all these webinars. The voice is clear now? Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. Good. I don't know if the company will start by video for two minutes and then we will start our webinar. Okay, shall I start now? Yes, okay. yes please pull yeah. start. Okay. Shall I present uh, one of our product, Dr. Nasser, in just two minutes? Dr. Nasser, do you hear me? Yes. My, my voice is clear now. Some sort of echo. Some sort of echo in your voice, Dr. Nos. Fisa the soup. I'm saying that now we have to start the webinar. Um, 
Okay, please. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you in webinar number nine among the series of webinars organized by the Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgeons in collaboration with the Continental Association of African Neurological Societies as the president of the Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgeons. And on behalf of all Egyptian neurosurgeons, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the presence of our speakers, Professor Jack Moros, who is the director of the cerebrovascular program at Miami University, and Professor uh, Mohammed El Fei, honorary president of Egyptian Society of Neurosurgery and of Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies. Let me welcome the moderator, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Muhammad Fuad al Professor of Neurosurgery at Cairo University. I uh, would like to uh, thank all the participants uh, to this webinar and thank uh, Professor Omar Youssef and Eva Company for organizing this session. Thank you all for accepting our invitation and for contributing to this activity. For those who have Zoom application, if you don't have Zoom application in the mobiles or laptops, there will be live stream of this webinar, the YouTube channel of our organization. For all the audience, you can participate by chat questions and we will monitor that through the panel. Thank you very much. And now I give the speech to the moderator, Dr. Mohammed Fouad Dash. Mohammed, okay. are you here? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. You guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, um, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to host this uh, webinar um, to provide education in the field of uh, uh, skull base and vascular neurosurgery regarding the approaches, techniques, and uh, way of managing these complex uh, vascular lesions. Uh, with that, we'll start our, our event today. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Fouad Dash, consultant, uh, neurosurgery, Cairo University Hospital. Uh, I'm uh, the uh, consultant of brain tumor, skull base, and vascular neurosurgery, and I'm the director of the vascular unit at Cairo University Hospital. Um, it's uh, uh, I, 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 without further ado today, I would like to introduce Professor uh, Jack Marcos. Obviously, he doesn't need any introduction, but for those who don't know him, he is a world-recognized leader for skull base and vascular neurosurgery. He is a professor and coach of skull base and vascular neurosurgery at University of Miami and the past president of the Skull Base Society and World Federation. Um, but most importantly, Dr. Marcos is a real category of a, of a master surgeon and great mentor who used to teach and inspire faculties, residents, and students. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Marcos, for taking time of your busy schedule to join us in this webinar and teach the world the, um, these complex techniques of skull base and vascular neurosurgery. Thank you very much. And uh, I would invite you, please, to unmute yourself and share your screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Can you hear me? And can you see yeah. my slide? Yeah, sure. Great. 
to my to all my Egyptian friends, uh, thank you, Nasir, for inviting me. It's wonderful to be back with Mohammed Al Fiki, my good friend through WFNS and other areas. Masa al khair wal full wal yasmin la kull asdika il fi Masr wa ana min Lebanon taban wa tarfuni Lebanoni, but lah nhki taban bil Englishi. Otherwise, I have no clue how to use a single technical word in Arabic. I'm afraid to say. So huge pleasure to be with you all. Um, so yes, I'm at the University of Miami. I direct cerebrovascular and skull base. I'd like to thank my residents and fellows who helped me put some of my brainstem cavernoma cases together. And that's the subject of my first talk today. So here is the outline of the talk. I will uh, try to stick to the 30 minute time limit. I'm looking at my time right here. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the anatomy of the brainstem, the surgical principles, particularly the goals, the strategies, and the tactics you should use for the surgical approaches. And then I'm going to show case examples. I have many case examples for each section of the brainstem, but I cannot do it in half an hour. So I will skip su some sections of the brainstem just to try to cover as much as I can. Let's start with anatomy. Again, I, uh, I hope there are young people listening and I, I want to show them how important it is to understand first the anatomy of this complex region. And I encourage you to go and read and look at those <laughs> schematics from various textbooks later. But here is how you, have, you should think of the brain stem. You should think of the medulla, the pons and the midbrain whether it's axial, cross-sectional section, or parasagittal, or coronal sections, doesn't matter. But you need to spend a long time understanding the to uh, somatotopic representation of the nuclei and the tracts. <clears throat> so here is what it looks like once you try to make them uh, 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 colored. So yeah, obviously, I have no time to go into every detail. This is the rostral midbrain. I just want you to notice how busy, of course, the brainstem is with multiple things. But also, as you will see in a minute, where are the areas of surgical opportunities to enter when a pathology is present? So you will notice the pons being the largest is the most common location for brainstem cavernomas. Here is the caudal pons. Here is the rostral medulla, which probably is the hardest part given how dense things are and here is the caudal medulla. So that was pure anatomy. Let's talk about surgical anatomy. So we have to thank Albino Bricolo, uh, God rest his soul, who really started this decades ago when he talked about brainstem, cavern, uh, brainstem gliomas mostly. He started this concept of risky areas and safe zones, or at least relatively safe entry zones to the brainstem. And many people have adapted that line of thinking. Uh, so, so I'd like to tell you where I think, based on you know other collaborators, other people who have uh, written about this before, this is wh what I think are reasonable entry zones to think about. In the midbrain, here, the enteromedial zone. Uh, in the posterior midbrain, perhaps the intercollicular zone. And here is a very useful zone. Uh, on the sulcus, the uh, laterally. Uh, the pons, I put this in orange because it's been said to be a, 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 a safe zone, but of course there's a basilar artery here. I've never used this per se as a safe zone. In green are definitely the safe zones, suprafacial and infrafacial in the floor of the fourth ventricle. And the safest, them, safest zone of all is the uh, peritrigeminal zone, lower pontine zone, and those three areas around the trigeminal nerve entry zone. In the medulla, I put this one in orange because again, I've never used it, and that is not a clinically useful scenario to go between the medullary pyramids. But what is useful is the uh, enterolateral and posterolateral zone around the olive. And of course, an extension of what you would call a midline myelotomy from the cervical cord can happen also in the medulla and lateral medullary zone 
right here. And you can see here in the cross section. So by summarizing all these entry points in green arrows, you can see where they are in the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Uh, so then you build up your surgical approaches based on that. And again, I, um, you, can, you know what they are, the terra, perineal, transylvian, pretemporal, subtemporal, infratentorial, supracerebellar, occipital, transtentorial, uh, midline, suboccipital, far lateral, petrosal, anterior petrosal. We'll, I'll try to cover some of those things through case examples as I go along. I think the couple slides that are coming are probably the most important part of my talk uh, because I want to at least share with you how I think uh, conceptually about this topic. Uh, so what are the surgical principles? What are your goals first? That relies on your conceptual reasoning. What are your strategies? That relies on your analytical planning. And tactics is how you execute your surgery. So there are three layers. And this is really the most important slide. There are, in my opinion, four steps for these three layers. I, I, those, I mean, you can certainly, those of you really interested, you can take a picture of the screen and, and, and read it later because I, I don't want to spend enormous amount of time on it. You need to think how to get there, how to find the lesion and leave no trace behind and re resect it completely. Those are the four goals we all have. Each one of them relies on something. How to get there, you need to understand surface geometry. How to find it, you need to understand depth geometry. To cause no complications, you need optimal intra, intra, uh, optimal intraaxial neural path. And lastly, to remove it completely, you need to apply some basic ergonomics in microsurgery. And then the tactics, I'm not going to read them, but you can imagine each one of those things has things related to it. Um, I'll try to cover them. Now, based on my 25 year experience now being a neurosurgeon and doing th this kind of surgery, I, I think I summarized in this slide what uh, common mistakes we make in, in dealing with these lesions and or what causes suboptimal management results. Uh, you can make mistakes at any of those four levels I discussed in the previous slide, but I've highlighted some of the major things. Number one, not knowing when not to operate, meaning being inappropriately aggressive. Number two, missing the opportunity of when to operate, meaning, meaning being inappropriately conservative. The other mistake, anatomy doesn't mean pathology. All these beautiful uh, cadaveric dissections I showed you, that is only the starting point. There is the pathology in addition to that. So the concept of safe entry zone is meaningless when there is a lesion that distorts all of this anatomy. I re next mistake is I tell you, I remind you favorable geometry does not mean favorable physiology. And I'll show you examples of this important point later. Uh, you don't just plan your surgery based on geometry. Where is the lesion closest to the surface? That's only part of it. Is your path to it the least uh, dangerous? That's what matters. So the obvious entry point is not always the safest point. And this is very true in the fourth ventricle floor. Suboptimal execution of step one or step two in the previous slide will lead to suboptimal execution of step three and step four. Cavernous malformations look like cauliflowers. I forgot uh, what cauliflower is in Arabic, but you know the shape of a cauliflower, multiple little lumps and bumps. It's very easy to leave a residual cavernoma if you don't realize that you have to look for a cauliflower shaped thing. Small vein draining the cavernoma, I take them during surgery. There's a concept you cannot touch any vein. No, that's wrong. The small vein, not the major deep uh, DVA, not the major developmental venal anomaly, the small vein, if you leave it, the cavernoma will recur in my experience. And I've had 
two or three cavernomas that I've taken out recur. When I go back, I've realized that tiny vein I wanted to save probably had tiny cavernomas on it. And radiosurgery, I'm going to say it the way I see it, has no role, absolutely no role in brainstem cavernoma. Uh, I don't have time to cover that literature. Even my colleagues in Sweden and other places who do this routinely recognize it does not change the natural history. So what are the surgical approaches? Well, if you open any paper, any textbook, whatever, all the publications, this is a traditional way. Either they list the surgical approaches you could use and then tell you where you can get, what target area, or the other way around, they say, well, where do you want to get? Midbrain, pons, medulla, what surgical approaches you can use? You can do it both ways, and you should do it both ways. These tables, you see them everywhere uh, from many papers. Uh, Bob Spetzler, who I still think probably has to this day the largest experience uh, of about 400 brainstem cavernomas. That was his paper. But I want to show you even in his hands, the morbidity was uh, significant. Look at the top right, 53% new deficits. Uh, resolution of pre-op symptoms in 52%. Um, Post-op hemorrhage rate, 8%. So this is not uh, uh, an easy surgery. It's not an easy population of patients. Uh, there was a meta-analysis more recently by Yashar Kalani showing pretty much from the literature in about 2,500 patients. Again, the, the, the results can be, uh, the post morbidity is significant, 34%. Rehemorrhage or res of residual occurred in 58%. So that tells us we have to really be super, super careful in selecting patients. Again, from that meta-analysis, you can look it up and look at those various numbers. The PONS is about 60% of the case. So, but we still have to operate on this patient. So what is the safest way to do it? Well, the safest way, I, enormous, I have enormous respect for Al Roten in everything I do. Uh, always go back to his basic principles. And, we, and I'm going to use his dissections to show us a little bit the various approaches. Terrinal, COZ, cranioorbital, transylvian, it gets you here. These are the zones it gets you to. Transylvian pretemporal, it gets you here, the shaded area in blue. Anterior transpetrous, kawazi, gets you a little bit lower to the upper pons, but no lower than the seventh and eighth nerve. Supracerebellar infratentorial approach. I love this approach. It has three variants, midline, paramedian, and extreme lateral. And there are many subtleties I don't have time to discuss that you have to tailor it a little bit. Now, Dr. Roten, for example, when he depicts the posterior interhemispheric transtentorial approach, he puts the patient or the cadaver in this, in this position. Uh, you shouldn't. At surgery, you should put the patient with the head horizontal, so you don't use a retractor, and uh, you allow gravity to make the occipital parietal area fall away from the folks. You could put a retractor on the folks upwards, so you can access this complex zone. And of course, the midline suboccipital telovelar approach, the retrosigmoid approach, uh, the pre-sigmoid posterior petrosal, whether you do retrolab, partial translab, translab, transcochlear, all of those can get, you, can get you there. And very useful, extremely useful, the far lateral approach gets you lower pons, uh, enterolateral medulla. So now I'm going to go through the rest of the talk, through case examples, try to show you um, how I selected different approaches in different uh, things. So let's start. And this is where I'm going to have to skip because I have examples at every section, but I cannot possibly cover it all. Rostral midbrain. Let's start with an example. I'm going to show you a case of a transylvian pretemporal half and half approach. This is, uh, if I, I'm going to obviously skip a lot through the videos, but if you want to take my message, read what I've written at the top. For example, here I want to show you 
noting note the difference between the draining vein and the developmental venous anomaly on this case. So here is the lesion. You can see it in the left midbrain. It grew over time, patient symptomatic. We do a DTI tracking. Here is my left-sided approach, Sylvian Fisher splitting, and we are going to save the veins. Very important to save the veins on the way in. Here I'm putting a retractor and removing a little bit of the uncus. Here is the surface of the midbrain. Here is the SCA. Here is the PCA. And look at the discoloration on the color uh, on the surface of the midbrain. And of course, I'm using navigation. And here is my entry point into the enterolateral midbrain between the SCA and the PCA. And here is the cavernoma. And as you will notice, and those of you who do these surgeries, once you're there, the surgery is the same anywhere you are. You get the hematoma out. You I try to remove the cavernoma in as much one piece as I can. Of course, it's not always possible. But what I mean to say, I spend a long time developing the plane around it, around the gliotic plane, before I start cutting into it. If you cut into it too early, you get lost, and you can leave residual cavernoma. And here, uh, I want to try to find the part of the video that shows the vein. Here, I'm taking a vein. See, this is not a DVA. This is a draining vein of the cavernoma that must be resected. Again, I'm stressing to the younger people, I am not saying remove the DVA. I'm saying remove the small vein that drains the cavernoma into a DVA if a DVA is present. And when you finish, you inspect, you inspect, you inspect repeatedly. You challenge the gliotic plane to make sure. Oh, I'm sorry, here is the vein. You see it? Right there, right there. So that's a vein that I am taking near the end of the resection. And, and when we finish, I sometimes put an endoscope uh, into the cavity. Uh, to show you, look, the brain should be as pristine as possible, save the bridging veins. There was no necessity to remove those. And that's an immediate post-op MRI showing complete resection. So another example of a dorsal midbrain lesion. Uh, I'm going to show you a thalamomesencephalic cavernoma where I use the posterior interhemispheric supracollicular transpineal gland. I went through the pineal gland to get to this. This was a complicated case. A uh, 50-year-old female, you will see her cavernoma in a minute. Again, this abuse of radio surgery. She was you, uh, treated elsewhere with cyber knife, kept getting worse. Dysarthria, hemiparesis, parino syndrome referred to me. Uh, I want you to, when I, you look at the video, please notice uh, the uh, vein of uh, Rosenthal and the pineal gland entry point. So let me show you the lesion. I'll skip straight to the lesion. Look where it is. I'm going to show you. Look at it sagittal. Seriously, to do radio surgery on this, it's pointless, absolutely pointless. Not only pointless, it's harmful, as you saw. So here is the approach I selected. Here is what we're doing. You notice the hemisphere is with gravity, is falling away without any retraction. I had to take this vein, the bridging vein, to get in. You get, you cut into the tentorium. This is posterior interhemispheric approach. Then you can see vein of Galen. You will see Rosenthal in here, and I have to work between the veins. We're going to skip through all that. And here is a pineal gland. You can see I don't want to enter through the collicular plate. It's safer to enter through the pineal gland, certainly in an adult. And look at the great view I have. There is zero self, there is no self retaining retraction. Uh, lumbar drain and positioning is what gives you this view. I can put a retractor if I want on the folks but not on the brain that's ipsilateral. So we're going to get there. And same thing. 
you get around it, you cut it in pieces, and there is post op nice hemosiderin. The occipital lobe is not disturbed, um, and that's this case. I'm going to show you a midbrain caudal AVM, I mean, cavernoma, uh, that was operated elsewhere through the wrong approach. I'll show you why it's the wrong approach. Somebody did a telovelar approach, and I believe. The, the approach I used is, is the correct one, the supracerebellar infratentorial approach in the Concord position. Let me show you the case. The patient was symptomatic, uh, went to the other institution with a fourth nerve palsy and the left hemiparesis. And here is the lesion, the acute bleed in July 2019. Here is the lesion. It's too high. And also, there is a DVA you will see behind it. So it is wrong to go from below in this case. Much better to come from above the cerebellum. So the surgeon who went in uh, encountered the DVA right there coming from below. That is the DVA on the angiogram, developmental venous anomaly. So he aborted the case. He went in this way, couldn't do anything with the cavernoma. Luckily, the patient recovered many months and was referred to me at that stage with the cavernoma. And uh, here is, she recovered really well. Look at the very nice view of the DVA. Look at the cavernoma. Uh, so look where it is. It's so much easier to go above the cerebellum. And that's what I did. But notice, not midline supracerebellar, because this angle would be steep. You have to go paramedian supracerebellar because the tentorium is flatter. So that's a quick view of that video. I showed you the imaging already. Here is the approach. Uh, right side, no retraction. The cerebellum, it's such a lovely approach. Uh, some people do it in the sitting position. It's, I believe it's totally unnecessary, but it does give you nice pictures when you do it sitting position. It gives you a lot more room for sure. But I think if you, you know how to use the Concord prone position, look, what, why do I need more view than what I have? Excellent view, fourth nerve, superior cerebellar artery. And look at the cavernoma. It's on the, on the surface of the midbrain. And I have no self-retaining retraction. I'm using just dynamic retraction. And it's quite easy once you're there. You do the same thing, separate the plane, work below the fourth nerve, above and below the superior cerebellar artery uh, until it's out. Very nice, clean cavity at the end. Notice I'm spending time uh, hemostasing. The SCA is hanging in the breeze. No, no self-retaining retraction. Uh, it's a very nice approach, uh, the, superior, the supracerebellar infratentorial, and that's a resection uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, I wanted you to see the fourth nerve and the superior cerebellar artery. And that's a post-op view. That's the angle of the approach. And that's, uh, again, to remind you where the DVA was. I'll give you a, a couple of examples from the pons, rostral pons. I'm going to show you. Again, you have to use the simplest approach that gets you there, and that is safe, of course, simple and safe. I'm going to show you a pontomesencephalic cavernoma where I use the subtemporal approach during pregnancy. She, I'll show you what, uh, what uh, I'm not going to read all this, but uh, she was pregnant. This is her third pregnancy. She knew she had a cavernoma. She lived in Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm sorry, in Panama, and she had multiple symptoms. They started her on steroids, no surgery. Look, she became cushionoid. She's sitting here in a wheelchair with cushionoid from the steroids given to her over many months instead of operating on her. Now, I, do, I don't blame them. It's a, comp, it's a complex uh, cavernoma. Look at it here uh, into the fourth ventricle. So my here is one of my lessons is should you go Telovelar, she had normal facial nerve. No, don't go telovelar. That would be the obvious choice, but that would be a mistake because 
the easiest and safest <coughs> is subtemporal from the left side because that's where <coughs> the lesion reaches the safest zone. That's what I did. Here we are monitoring her baby uh, during surgery, fetal monitoring. <laughs> left, you can hear the fetal uh, heart sounds. And uh, uh, I took it out. Um, uh, here she is. She actually improved immediately after surgery. You see that quite a bit with some brainstem cavernoma. That leg was very weak. This is immediately post-op. Third nerve was unchanged. The third nerve improved uh, uh, later on. Um, another example from the pons now. Rostral pons. Um, I'm, I'm kind of running a little bit out of time, so let me speed it up. This is, I'll show you a subtemporal transtentorial approach. Actually, these videos, this video I'm showing you has been published, so you can look it up online. My, the first author is my former fellow, Dr. Zenonos. Maybe for the sake of time, I will just skip through it. I just want to show you how we think. Here is a lesion. I want to show you how we think about the anatomy. And I refer you to that video to show you how you should think of all the nuclei and the tracts and how you analyze the various possible approaches. And then this is a subtemporal approach and cutting the tentorium. The tentorium can then be reflected and secure hematoma. The hem the, and there, when you reflect so the, the tentorium, here is a fourth nerve, like the other case, then the, the cavernoma is removed. I'm gonna... Uh, show you an example of a caudal pons where I use the Kawase approach. And uh, again, this is a right Kawase approach. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, I have to thank my former resident and partner, your very own Muhammad Sami El Hamadi, who was my resident, one of my best trainees. He's now is in the Middle East, but he was my resident and fellow at the time. So here is the lesion growing in the caudal pons and because of the DTI I felt coming laterally is better so here is the subtemporal Kawase approach I am going to skip through many details here we are after drilling the anterior petrous apex here we are entering the anterolateral pons and here is a cavernoma being removed uh, and here she is post-op, actually improved. Here she is moving everything. Here she is a few weeks later. Um, I believe I only, oops, sorry. I believe I should stop. I think I've reached my time limit. But uh, if, you don't mind, if, don't, if you don't mind, I'll put my, uh, uh, well, here are some references. Those of you from publications we have done, you're interested in, in reviewing some of those details but mostly uh, I want to invite you like I'm uh, in your webinars uh, I, I am on Twitter and I post educational uh, offerings every Wednesday and Thursday we have a symposium that we've been doing for many weeks now uh, my partner Mike Ivan does the Wednesday I do the Thursday on skull base and vascular if you're interested visit our website down here it has all the information and of course it's free and it's uh, uh, we have big names from all over the world speaking every week thank you very much i will stop right now all right okay thank you uh, professor jack for this wonderful uh, lecture um actually we have uh, five or seven minutes for questions about this uh, interesting lecture. So uh, I might start with the with the first one. Uh, I want to ask you about the incidence of uh, bleeding from uh, uh, infratentorial uh, uh, cavernomas, um, the incidence of bleeding in the in the first instance, and the, the incidence of rebleeding because. I, I, I came to find that the incidence increases when the cavernoma bleeds. And uh, this makes me uh, very worried to start treating these lesions. Would you take the same concept? 
Yes, ex I agree with you. So, as you know, the literature has been all over the place on the estimate of bleeding risk because everybody talks about what is the time denominator. Do you divide by the time the patient has been alive or from the time the patient is symptomatic? You can get totally different numbers, which is why in some Japanese series you get bleeding risk of 35% per risk. So here is what I tell my patients. I tell, from what we know, the incidence of bleeding in a previously asymptomatic, unbled cavernoma in the brainstem is probably between 0.3 and 1% per year. Once they bleed, that goes up to about 5%. In the supratentorial compartment, it probably goes up to about 2 or 3%. You get authors who, that's why they say, well, anywhere between 2 and 7%. That, that's what I tell patients those numbers because you have to give them some numbers to have a concept. I don't know how you, you right. handle it in your practice, but that's what I do. Yeah. Uh, the the other thing is um, uh, the timing of surgery. Uh, I I would tend to wait for a couple of weeks before I start uh, uh, operating on such uh, brainstem cavernomas, giving time for the hematoma to liquefy, something in 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 a window of about three four weeks. Uh, would you would you agree for this? I agree. I vary between anywhere two weeks and six weeks depends on the size of the hematoma. The bigger it is, the more I will give it time to liquefy. Now, on the other hand, as one of my slides, I put, I mean, you know, sometimes you get clustering and patients bleed and then two days later bleeds again and they become wheelchair bound. You know, I've taken a few cavernomas, yeah. quote unquote, emergently to the OR because there is an actual hematoma, you know, yeah. and those patients sure. get better immediately. Absolutely. Right. And uh, um, I, I want to make a comment on the uh, dorsal kind of uh, midbrain lesion that you showed uh, through a posterior interhemispheric approach. Uh, I had a problem really in, in these approaches recognizing the straight sinuses. It's not always the really easy to recognize. Would, would you agree for using navigation to, to, to uh, localize it? P perfect. I, it, was, it was there in my video. I skipped it. I was One of the things, I blue lined the straight sinus and I was going to tell the, the younger people particularly, they look at the anatomy, they think the folks and the tentorium are sharply separate from each other. No, it's a continuous sheet of dura and the sinus isn't always very blue. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. Navigation to find the sinus, uh, color it with the pen, then cut the tentorium. Right. Okay, and uh, I want to uh, just uh, uh, grab the attention of the uh, young uh, uh, neurosurgeons here that uh, the uh, the the supracollicular approach that you, you mentioned. Uh, has ne should never be done without uh, monitoring. Uh, 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 would you would you give us uh, some idea about the types of uh, monitoring you use for this kind of uh, 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 complicated surgery? Yeah, for sure. I I skipped that for time, but um, you know, so brainstem evoked potentials, somatosensory evoked potential, motor evoked potential and based on where you are, mapping of individual cranial nerves. So if we're in the fourth ventricle, we're gonna map seventh nerve, not only map it, but sti um, stimulate it to look for it. And again, I skipped several videos where I find the facial colliculus <clears throat> and I pencil it, um, right. absolutely critical. Okay, uh, in the endoscopic era, we, we came to see some uh, approaches uh, through in extended endoscopic endonasal approaches, especially in, in midbrain lesions and anterior pontine lesions. Uh, some uh, well, well uh, uh, trained endoscopic guys uh, start now to mobilize the, the pituitary and drill the dorsum celli and get into this uh, particular area um, through the endoscope. Uh, would, would you have a similar yeah. experience or have you, have you tried so, this? 
um, uh, I have not done it for a cavernoma. I do lots of endonasal endoscopic surgery for all kinds of things, craniopharyngioma, cordoma, and so forth. Yesterday, our Thursday seminar was on this. And yesterday, we had such a case presented. And exactly what you're describing, uh, hemitransposition of the pituitary gland for a midbrain cavernoma. My concept of this is I don't agree with it at all. You're using a complicated, it doesn't matter how skilled you are, we all know how to do it, but why put the pituitary gland at risk, major high flow CSF leak at risk, when right, there is right. a relatively simple, well, simple, simpler way to get there. Yeah. I tell you when is an ideal case, if it's smack dab in the middle of, in the midline of the pons and right. completely covered by the pons laterally and you don't have a craniotomy that gets you there. And I've seen a couple of those cases. Those make sense to go transclival. But only if right. there is no craniotomy that is available. Our cranies are simple. We all do them. Right. Uh, the last question about cavernomas is, uh, would you consider having uh, some sort of a CT angiography or formal four vessel angiography to delineate the DVA uh, prior to taking uh, brainstem cavernomas? Or uh, do you just uh, do this if you have an, a doubt of having associated lesions with the cavernomas? Yeah, no, I, would, I don't do an, a DSA angiogram on every cavernoma. I do, it, uh, uh, I do a CTA where you usually have an MRI. From the MRI, you can see if there is a large flow void around it, as I showed you a couple of examples. In those, I will do an angiogram to plan my approach. But usually, I don't. I think it's an extra uh, wasted test. Uh, a CTA will show you what you need cross-sectional or not cross-sectional. I mean, shows a 3D view of the veins. But if, if there is any doubt, or particularly if there is a doubt, it's not a cavernoma. Sometimes, right. throm I have many cases, thrombosed aneurysm or a small yeah. AVM. I mean, if there is anything fishy about it, of course, do an angiogram. Yeah, but I came to believe that these cavernomas has some blood supply as well. Uh, during surgery, I, I, I see them. I see them always. Do you agree for this? Oh, yeah, these no. These cavernomas has some blood supply, arterial blood supply even. Oh, for, of course they do. And at surgery, as you said, you find them, you coagulate. The problem is it's too low flow to show on a regular angiogram. I am sure right. future technology will identify the tiny low flow. It's like AVMs that have been radio surgery, and I've operated on a couple of those where the angiogram shows no flow. Patients have right. radio necrosis. You operate on them. The AVM is still bleeding, yet the angiogram was negative. So it's the same right concept it's a threshold of blood flow uh, uh, when i first started uh, uh, operating on on cavernomas uh, on the brainstem uh, maybe 15 years ago or so uh, i i was kind of conservative do uh, using bipolar uh, within the brainstem within the cavernomas and uh, but today i became very liberal uh, using it with the new non-stick irrigating bipolar w would you agree that using bipolar in this area uh, uh, would be beneficial in, in cases oh yeah no to now to, let's be careful to shrink the cavernoma not Obviously, to bipolar yeah, sure. around the cavernoma. Yeah, absolutely. I've used. Yeah, that's how I use it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank uh, you. Professor Great Marcus. questions. Thank you for your moderation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Let me thank uh, Professor uh, Jack Moros, uh, Mohammed, for this great talk. We are always learning from you as Egyptian neurosurgeons. Thank you, Jack, very much. Ahla wa sahla. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Now uh, I I would like to. Uh, 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 introduce Professor uh, Elfei. He is a professor of uh, neurosurgery at uh, Alexandria Hospital, Alexandria University, and he is the former uh, chairman of the uh, Egyptian Society of Neurosurgery. I would like to uh, um, uh, invite him to share his uh, screen and uh, start his topic about endoscopic uh, clival cordomas.
please. Go. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, I hear you. Okay. Good. I like your talk, Jack. It's very good. Highly Thank you, my friend. Highly education. Everybody else, do you hear me? There is yes, a little sir. choppiness, in Mohammed. Yes. A little bit. It breaks a little bit now and again. Yeah. Looks like that. Hello. Tamam, Doctor Sain, Hadrathik. Yes, yes, Doctor Fagi, it's perfect. Okay. We'll go on and talk about uh, comprehensive management strategy in endoscopic cryos cordoma after we heard this very nice presentation of uh, Professor Moros. Uh, we enjoyed it very much. Uh, just as a wrap up, we'll talk about current best cordoma management, why endoscopy is needed in cordoma, the advantage of navigation combined with endoscopy, and uh, the radiotherapy options, why surgery is a must, and whether clivus cordoma is a surgical curable disease, and uh, thoughts about all uh, previous points made us think of a changing paradigm in cordoma management for maximizing patient surgery and safety. Uh, I started practice in 81, a long time ago, at the time when uh, skull-based surgery through an extensive skull-based approaches was very common, like transfacial, transmaxillary, and uh, extensive skull-based approaches with consequent discovery that most of these approaches has resulted in uh, an increased incidence of patient misery and uh, complication. And uh, starting from 2007, we started to develop our experience in comprehensive cryo cordoma management, and then we'll give you our recommendation. The modern concept according to the Cordoma Foundation is that Cordomas are rare, slowly growing. However, they are aggressive and life-threatening because of their uh, size. And that outcome depends mainly on tumor behavior and that's related in most part on its genetic predisposition. Proper treatment can significantly prolong survival. Whether it can be curative or not, uh, in the sense of curative and that's it, you don't need to see your uh, surgeon or physician anymore. That's still questionable. Surgery is up till now the treatment of choice as radical as possible. If you can do it in on block resection, that's fine, but that's very dreadful in clivus cordoma. Chemotherapy is ineffective uh, with the recent use of conformal radiotherapy and radiotherapy options. We can use them for residual or recurrent tumors. So we can uh, remove as much as possible. We can use modern uh, radiotherapeutic uh, options. The best results are achieved if you have a maximum resection, uh, going down with the tumor size to less than 25 cc, followed by broton beam radiation. However, you need to use a very high dose of irradiation up to 70 grade. I remember that what we use usually in most of the fractionated radiotherapy is about 54 uh, grade. Overall survival depends on the local control of the disease. Clear margins, however, are rarely achieved in less than 50% of clivus cordum. The Lancet Oncology published an article in 2012 stating that clivus cordoma is unique from other locations with the enhanced emphasis on preservation of prolonged of, uh, neurological function, uh, trying to achieve a maximally safe cytoreductive surgery 
and use advanced forms of radiotherapy. Uh, endoscopic navigation rationale, uh, the use of the transnasal or transoral uh, approach to intracranial cavity started in Egypt uh, during mummification. And it was revived early with Cushing, with, uh, and then he abandoned it until hardly retracts to develop, and we have uh, the uh, transnasal uh, endoscopic pituitary surgery, and then extended pituitary uh, surgery and extended the skull base and transnasal endoscopic approaches. Uh, this made us able to work on uh, the cordoma in the client. On block curative cliven resections seems impossible because of its site and its uh, related neurovascular structure. Uh, we uh, got our navigation guidance in 2009 and we used navigation guidance to increase the resection limit and decrease complications. There is no surgical limitation for using trans endoscopic transoral or pure endoscopic or transcervical even if you, you use to do transcervical operations. Transoral endoscopy combined with the transnasal endoscopic procedure provides wider linear and angle uh, surgical routes that can lead to uh, exposing the carotid artery uh, close to the median nerve and at the perigo sphenoid fissure, and then you start from there, and the clivus would be on your uh, medial side, uh, and then you can be very safe in your uh, exposure, avoiding the neurovascular uh, structures. Uh, the frame navigation uh, provides continuous 3D localization of intraoperative uh, real time and it helps keep a uh, correct trajectory and you can recheck every time you feel you are off uh, site. And now it's a standard technique in neurosurgery. When we started doing this, uh, it was still a, a kind of trial and error until uh, it became standardized. And it's a valuable guidance to the surgeon to increase safety with consequent smooth surgical recovery. Uh, the many, many invasive approaches are effective in about 95% of intended cordoma resections when they are smooth. When they are big, that sometimes needs uh, uh, several goods. Provides a better decompression without the transfacial approaches that might lead to a lot of uh, extensive approaches and uh, mutilation. Neuronavigation. Uh, when you fuse the bone uh, windows on the CT scan and the bone details on the CT scan and the, with the MRI uh, on the navigation device, it will give us uh, a better orientation of the surgical field and we can recognize the residual uh, lesions. Working mainly on uh, bony lesions or a lesion inside the bone that's just close to uh, the brain important structures makes us uh, avoid the problem of uh, brain shift in most of the cases. And uh, the main drawback is CSF leak. And we have to try to use a proper CSF sealing uh, technique. The radiotherapy options are either conventional stereotactic, uh, brachytherapy can deliver high doses, and recently heavy particles can be used. Uh, the role of radiotherapy in cordomas is valuable in newly diagnosed cordomas, whether pre or post-operative, to reduce recurrence. Main treatment instead of surgery, only for residual confirmed tumors. Uh, recurrent cordomas, uh, curative treatment, high doses for the recurrent uh, tumors are used as palliative treatment to hold the progress of enlargement of the tumor. Uh, 
or it can be used for advanced or metastatic or individual tumor sites or in combination with uh, systemic disease. Uh, this is currently being studied or it can be used as palliative uh, surgery. In a study of a broken beam radiotherapy published in 2012 on 34 skull based uh, cordomas, uh, only 23 to 39% local control was achieved using conventional radiotherapy in the lower doses at five years. With the use of a broken peak radiotherapy with Bragg peak uh, physical property using the doses high up to 67 grays in 38 fractions, uh, this has improved the uh, local control uh, rate of, uh, of the patients. And uh, our policy has been trying to partially remove the tumor if the tumor is so extensive in order to uh, give space for the irradiation and get the tumor away from important neurovascular structure that might be badly affected uh, by the effect of irradiation even in a delayed form. And in this way, we can avoid mutilating sur uh, surgery with, uh, without sacrificing function. Uh, carbon ion radiotherapy is not available in Egypt. However, a, a publication in 2011 uh, has shown that on uh, 96 patients, the skull-based cordomas showed uh, an 80% local control at three years with a dose of 60 to, seven, uh, to 70 uh, grays and 70% local control at five years with an overall survival of 91% at three years and 88% at five years. However, in spite of that, surgery is a must in clival cordomas. Uh, cordomas, we use the high doses because cordoma is resistant to radiation. And there is a risk of brainstem uh, affection and lower coronary nerves since they are always in, in the field of uh, irradiation with consequent radio necrosis. Uh, even with the uh, broken uh, In addition, these two advanced uh, radiosurgical techniques are not available everywhere. There are few uh, machines that can uh, provide the conformal uh, broken beam or the black peak and carbon ion radiotherapy. Uh, there is a possibility that intensity modulated radiotherapy might be variable and the third option in, uh, in control surgery, radiotherapy or chemotherapy, chemotherapy cannot be used because it is completely ineffective in uh, cordom. In a study of uh, patient outcome at a long-term follow-up after aggressive microsurgical resection of cranial-based cordoma on 74 patients who had a total of 121 procedures, 50% uh, of patients were alive with disease after a follow-up of eight years, and they died. They died, 15% uh, died of disease, and 3% died of complications. Uh, they were able to achieve a gross total resection in They yeah. gross total resection in 72% of cases, subtotal resection in 28, and the morbidity was high at 32%. 10 year recurrence rate free was 31%, uh, higher in primary surgery than in reoperation, about 26% only, and that was a significant uh, difference. And they concluded that the aggressive microsurgical resection can be followed by long-term tumor-free survival with good functional outcome. However, SAMI in 2007, uh, in multiple approaches, concluded that cordoma cannot be regarded as a surgically curable tumor given the five and 10-year 
survival. Uh, it's mainly the biological behavior of the tumor that determines its invasiveness and hence its recurrence. Few studies have looked into the genetic chromosomal aberrations from the US, Europe, and Japan. Why we should use radical surgery in cliver cordoma? Subtotal reception patients have nearly four times more recurrence and nearly six times more death at five years, even with the best hands in open microsurgical exposures. Local recurrence is very common, even after what's assumed to be a radical resection. Early management of residuals or recurrences is preferable than delayed management. Many patients thus will go forced, staged, multiple surgeries over years due to the presence of recurrence. So in the past, when I started practicing some 40 years ago, uh, our goal of surgery was to perform a technically successful operation, remove the tumor, regardless of the patient's condition in the post-operative period. When we started performing these uh, horrendous operations, we were encountered with so many complications. And currently, nowadays, it's important, the surgeon's task is to choose the procedure that results in the best possible outcome for the patient. Best possible outcome. The question is, is unblock surgical resection the only modality that helps cordoma patients in developing countries? These guys in Africa are happy. They are all happy together using this uh, made uh, play machine. And it's important to use a comprehensive team strategy with the development of more technologies that can help the patients beside the surgery. So if cordoma is not a surgically curable disease in the sense that it will cure the tumor for good, is it logic to attempt to gross total unblocked surgical resection? resulting in a mutilating neurological outcome. Hard to tell, especially in the presence of other treatment modalities which might enhance patient outcome without show showing the muscles of the great surgeon. And Alexander, we reached, if you cannot perform a curable radical unblock resection and we need to maintain patient satisfaction. We have three different perspectives. Use endoscopic surgery, redo reasonable, and use radio surgery in order to maintain patient satisfaction. Why don't we try other options in a comprehensive team strategy? The multi-speciality comprehensive management strategy that we think of is that radio surgery cannot be applied beyond a certain size. We all know about the size and radical surgery in large tumors unacceptably increases complication without decreasing the high recurrence rate. Multi-speciality comprehensive management strategy is a cornerstone in the management of large uh, tumors in this way. So our approach, we tried the transcranial, transfacial, transnasal, transoral, uh, they all failed to give us a decreased recurrent rate uh, before 2007. Our current policy is to use planned staged endoscopic, multidisciplinary, minimally invasive exposures performed based on patient specific criteria. We study each patient very thoroughly trying to reach what's best for him, which part of the tumor we will attack first and then which parts uh, we can attack later, trying to reach as uh, radical as possible during the first surgery and maintain the safety of the resection to preserve function. So we performed a staged endoscopic surgery, partially resected recurrent or irradiated cordomas can be subjected to endoscopic or transnasal transoral exposures. The goal is a safe radical resection suitable for the current era of medical practice, stressing the importance 
to achieving good postoperative function outcome rather than showing the surgeon as a hero, removing anything. Adjuvant treatment can be applied early in this case and aggressively to achieve a prolonged complication-free survival. Our objective was to evaluate the electromagnetic frameless stereotactic navigation guidance combined with the staging endoscopy and sometimes followed by radio surgery in a comprehensive multidisciplinary strategy for the safe management of Kleiber Kurdo. And we studied the advantages and limitations uh, uh, during our work. Uh, a group in 2017 have published a uh, group by, uh, led by Tiet Matheisen showed that uh, gamma knife radio surgery was needed for tumor progression in five and 10 years survival of 82 and 50% were achieved, which is a very high uh, incidence. The comprehensive multidisciplinary strategy entails combining the staged endoscopic endonasal radical compression once, twice, or more with post op radio surgery or radiotherapy for inaccessible residual or recurrences. Pathological subtypes of chondrosarcoma or chondroid chordoma survived longer as in, in every other uh, case. Uh, we studied 20 large infiltrated cliver chordomas uh, during uh, 206 endoscopic scalp based surgeries between 2007 to 2019. Radio surgery was used in six of our residual lesions and we combined navigation with endoscopy in 12 chordoma surgeries. Redo was performed in five patients and the third redo was done in three patients when de novo lesions were seen, uh, an incidence of 40% recurrence and the maximum follow-up was 12 years. Our endoscopic approach is a pure binasal or, and or transoral. Uh, we don't use uh, an endoscopic holder. We use it as a freehand. We use four hands, uh, the neurosurgeon and the endoscopic surgeon, and sometimes maybe six hands if possible. If you have, uh, if we need uh, a neurosurgeon, an endonasal surgeon, and then we refer the patients for radio surgery and we use navigation whenever needed. We sometimes use neurophysiological monitoring uh, depending on the case. Uh, the important point is the repair. We use a casket fat, dura patch. Uh, septum, if we can, have that flab and a sealant. And in spite of that, we may have some incidence of CSF leak. Uh, redo endoscopy is shown here. Uh, and that's our machine uh, that uh, we use. And these are the approaches that we use apart from uh, the subfront. Uh, in a multimodality treatment team, of course, we don't have a broton beam or a carbon uh, ion, but we use uh, gamma knife. Uh, our results show that removal of accessible or decompression of infiltrated cliver cordoma was possible with a high degree of resectability using single or multiple endoscopic interventions, sometimes guided by electromagnetic navigation that may be complemented with radio surgery to achieve long-term functional survival in the majority of cases. We had the low complication rate, about 15%. Most of them recovered uh, and uh, achieved a good functional recovery. A single uh, surgical mortality was encountered due to CSF infection. Partial recovery, uh, at least, was noted in more than 80% of survivors, comparable to the results that were presented early in the talk uh, with the use of uh, aggressive surgical resection. More resection was associated when combining navigation with endoscopy in 12 out of uh, 20 cases. Show you some cases. This is a small chordoma uh, in a 60 years old male uh, with a gross total uh, removal using navigation in 2012. That was an early experience. And this is uh, a case that we were not able to remove uh, totally. Uh, and it proved to be a chordoma, especially the higher part was there and you can see the pituitary gland uh, here. And that was the H and E of that particular case. Uh, dural invasion uh, might occur. Rarely you will find a brain stem infiltration. And in this particular case, you were able to achieve a gross total removal 
with the use of navigation because we were concerned about the compression of the brain stem, especially that the uh, basilar artery was seen in the, uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, this is the patient that you can uh, see the septum and I'll advance this fast. You go below the cella and start your drilling and reach to try to identify the uh, nerves and then if you look here, you can see part of the brain stem and part of uh, the tumor that's just touching the brain stem. And after uh, the complete removal, proper closure is a must. So size does not limit chordoma in the scopic resection. It's the neurovascular infiltration and CSF leak that is important. The current challenge is safe maximal resection and CSF proof closure with good functional outcome. Uh, Cababianca confirmed that in a publication that the challenge is a repair and not a resection. Uh, few chordomas invade the dura. Many infiltrate, infiltrate into bone crevices, and that's where you need to be very radical. Try to remove as much as possible of in these uh, bone crevices, and that's where navigation may be helpful. Pedicle vascular receptor flaps provide excellent stealing for CSF leak. Uh, we use vascularized mucosal flap over uh, blocking gasket fat, graft, or other non vascularized material to see CSF leaks. However, fat or non-vascularized uh, material may interfere with healing <coughs> <coughs> or post-operative MRI interpretation. Uh, try to avoid crossing the uh, cranial nerves if you are working uh, deep inside uh, beyond the dura. Uh, and we were able to achieve a safe endoscopic resection in two thirds of the cordon. Uh, again, this case was subtotally in 2001, and you can see the effect of uh, the ceiling muscle graft uh, C. Uh, these were cases that we were not able to, to remove. I'll show you some. This is a 56 years male. Uh, we, we, we could not reach a surgical cure if anybody can do that. Uh, we tried subtotal resection, endoscopic navigation, redo, and then we went uh, transcranial and used radio surgery. Unfortunately, we were not able to remove it uh, totally. Uh, and the patient uh, ended up with uh, dying. Uh, can somebody do a single stage radical on block resection? On this, we were not able to do that, but we did a subtotal endoscopic navigation with a redo and uh, then a transcranial for the posterior left sided uh, lesion and uh, radio surgery. Uh, this patient actually uh, showed cavernous sinus involvement and carotid artery encasement. And uh, this is another patient with, uh, we were not able to perform a safe radical uh, resection because there was a brainstem infiltration actually. And the show the difference between this brainstem, uh, the region is shown touching the brainstem, but actually it was infiltrating the brainstem. So there is a changing rationale. Endoscopic navigation of safe wide decompression and pathological confirmation allows comprehensive staging of current effective alternative treatment modalities such as radio surgery or heavy particle radiotherapy when they are available. And it's very hard to offer a redo to a complicated or a dead patient, of course, if you use your patient. Uh, this patient we, we performed a, on the right hand, uh, on the left hand side of the screen uh, had subtotal resection because the brain stem was uh, involved and uh, we achieved uh, the one on the right hand side show we, we were able to achieve 
uh, a gross total resection with the use of navigation. So there is a changing rationale. In our area of the world, most patients present with huge region beyond conventional radical resection. Neurovascular structure, CSF leak, and reconstruction limit both microscopic and endoscopic block resection. Navigation guidance increased accuracy of localization and safe resection in skull-based tumors in general and in cordomas. And we sometimes use cranial nerve monitoring uh, whenever needed. This is a collection of the resection and uh, navigation. Total resection was achieved after a second redo in 12 out of 20 patients and about 60%. Uh, navigation was used in 20 out of 28 operations performed on this and uh, about 71%, uh, including six out of eight redo surgeries in 75% close, uh, didn't make much of a difference whether uh, it was the primary operation or the secondary uh, operation. And radio surgery was performed in, in uh, six of 28 resections. This is the extent of resection with the use of navigation or no use of navigation in the primary operation, first redo and secondary redo. And we encountered 15% uh, incidence of complication with a single brain stem injury, uh, cranial nerve injury in one, and CSF leak in one that killed the patient, and uh, a single mortality. Uh, this is uh, one of our cases uh, with a huge extradural uh, cordoma, no, no affection, and that's the uh, video. And I will skip the video for the sake of time. This is uh, a male, 54 years, extra dura repair. And that's in, in 2014. And this is a small clivus corduma that's been removed completely. And this is a three years post-operative uh, corduma uh, showing the residual tumor cavity and the repair. And uh, this is a, key, a rare case with a lateral involvement to the jugular foramen. And uh, he, this shows the value of navigation uh, in case you have a posterior extension to the brain stem. And this is a case where you can do very little because it is uh, there is an extensive skull base involvement in this 55 years. <laughs> Uh, this is another case showing where you can uh, remove the tumor and that's during the tumor repair. Uh, this is a 59 years old male uh, in a preoperative uh, CT scan uh, where there is uh, cavernous science and the carotid encasement and uh, we were not able to, to remove the, this tumor completely even with multiple goals. Uh, this is a case that's interesting because you might be surprised with a good outcome if you are uh, persistent. That's an extensive cordoma, two endoscopic uh, redos, perioneal and radio surgery, and that's the final outcome of this particular patient showing a very good control of the disease. Uh, this is a male of 50 years old with a bilateral 
corrected ectasima that I showed you before. And uh, in this particular case, we were concerned that it might be highly vascular and uh, it was in, in the post-operative uh, CT here, uh, we were able to remove صوت واطي كده ليه ارفع صوتك لو سمحت اوكي يا اسامه حاضر in conclusion the removal of a small or large cliver doma was possible with a high degree of resectability even with multiple interventions using endoscopic navigation low incidence of complication and good functional recovery was confirmed partial recovery at least was noted in more than 70% of the survivors more resection was associated with the use of navigation controlled endoscopy. Navigation guided endoscopy surgery of the skull based cordoma is an added safe armamentarium in a neurosurgical minimal invasive quest to this region. Endoscopic redo for surgically accessible residues is possible and uh, gets good results. Radio surgery could complete the risky job of uh, radicalization. Uh, Midline skull base cordomas were treated successfully endoscopically with navigation control with the staging and the radio surgery can be done. These are some references uh, for those interested. You can take it up from uh, the site of uh, the uh, ESNS. <coughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. Take care and wear a mask. Uh, Dr. Fuad, please uh, unmute yourself, Dr. Fuad. Uh, OK, thank you. C can you hear me, guys? Yes, now, okay. now yes. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Fethi, for this uh, comprehensive talk about chordomas and uh, chondrosarcomas. Uh, we, we are a bit uh, short of time, so we'll leave the questions to the end of the, this webinar. And uh, I want to uh, uh, invite Dr. Jack uh, Morris. Uh, is, is he... A little comment, he, can I? The, Oh yeah, yes. Professor Ghanem, hi, welcome. <laughs> nice to A see you. A little comment to Professor yeah, Tiki, sure. please. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, well, yeah. I, I must thank him very much indeed for such comprehensive review of um, Cordoma. Uh, yes, the, the recurrence and uh, depend on the histology. I mean, some some of them either chordoid chondroma or osteochondroma or whatever. Uh, if they are highly malignant, whatever we do, redo or not do, they already therapy, they are bad prognosis. But the, the, the main issue is we're trying as much as we can to resect because we don't know exactly is it the, what type, unless you exactly. So we don't miss the chance of taking, uh -huh. um, chasing the tumor as much as we can. The other thing is that um, um, can we, um, uh, the, the case you said the far lateral, I think this is a glomus jugulari tumor. It's not connected at all to the clivus. That's a glomus jugulari tumor. I think you have to review the histology about it. Okay, the, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Osama. That's what we thought first that it was uh, a glomus jugulari, but uh, on biopsy, we decided to go in and look at it because there was, uh, the radiologist raised the possibility that it might be a cordoma. And mm -hmm. uh, we went in with an extended endonasal and uh, we were able to obtain a biopsy that confirmed that it is uh, a cordoma. And then we went in again and we were able to remove uh, a good part of it, not actually completely. And uh, mm -hmm. we are the rest. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Okay. Thank you, Professor Fetti. And uh, uh, we would uh, like to invite Professor Marcus to share his screen and talk about the next okay. lecture okay. of orbital tumors. Please. Do, can I do it without Muhammad stop sharing his screen? I can just share mine. Did okay. Muhammad... Would you would you would you stop sharing your screen, Professor Muhammad Al Fetti? Ah, perfect. 
I think Good. I will try now. No, Can it, you stop sharing your screen, Professor Al Fiqi? Muhammad, I Professor think if Muhammad. you go near the top, ah, here you go. Yeah, that worked. Yeah. Do you see my slide and you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. great. Muhammad, that was magisterial. Thank you for reviewing that. <clears throat> most One of the most difficult things we do, you know, skull based cordomas, very frustrating. Uh, that was very nice. I enjoyed it too. Thank you. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now I'd like to talk about a topic, and I don't know how much neurosurgeons in Egypt or otherwise deal with pathologies of the orbit itself. And I want to show you why the neurosurgeon needs to master the orbit. So again, within the limit of time, uh, I will try to tour the anatomy, pathology, surgical approaches, techniques, and maybe video examples of uh, <clears throat> orbit. Uh, orbit is a perfect example of teamwork. What MOBS uh, stands for is this at my place in Miami is I started <clears throat> 10 years ago a, a weekly conference on Tuesday that lasts two hours between all the skull based specialists. I called it MOBS. It's called the multi specialist of the base of the skull. And this is many years ago, this picture. We are much, much bigger group now, probably 60 people between ENT, oculoplastic surgery. Um, radiation oncology, neuroendocrine, neurosurgery, you name it, radiation, you know, we all meet in a big library every Tuesday and we discuss cases. And of course, orbit, as you will see, is one of those nexus areas in the skull base that requires multiple specialists in many cases. But what is important, what the message of my talk today it's important for the neurosurgeon to understand the orbit, not to say, ah, well, my job stops at the uh, superior orbit of fissure and whatever happens anterior to that is up to the oculoplastic surgeons. No, the, you will see. So anatomy, some surgical approaches, and, uh, and this case examples. Uh, I refer you to an excellent article many years ago by Carolina Martins, who did her fellowship with Aroton. She's from Brazil. And uh, it's uh, the rule of seven is what she called it. She wrote it with Roten. And again, not to go into too much detail, but there are seven bones that make up the orbit, the frontal, the zygomatic, the maxillary in the outer rim. Each one of them is about 120 degree. And then the sphenoid weighing the ethmoid, the palatine, a very small portion of the palatine, and the lacrimal here. And uh, again, you, I, those of you who've listened to Al Roten's lectures in the past, you know how he likes to put the skull together like a puzzle. And you know, you can take each bone and put them together, the frontal bone, the ethmoid, the frontal orbital plate, the ethmoid orbital plate. Then you put the maxillae from below, the orbital surface, a thorough understanding of the pterygo maxillary fissure. Here you're putting frontal ethmoid and maxillary bone together. Here you're adding the funny shaped lacrimal bone. And here it is showing on the medial aspect of the orbit. And here, of course, the ethmoid on top of the sphenoid bone to give you an understanding of the back. Uh, again, again, for the young people listening in, get a cadaveric skull and dismantle it into the bones like this and put and play with it like a piece of puzzle to really, that's the only way to probably really understand the 3D complex anatomy of the entire skull base. Again, more osteology uh, uh, pictures. This is particularly the orbital process of the palatine bone. Uh, here is a perpendicular plate of the palatine bone. It has two processes, the orbital process and the sphenoid process. Here is a horizontal uh, plate of the palatine bone sphenoid and palatine. So the understanding of, of course, how the inferior orbital fissure forms, which is, of course, very different from the superior orbital fissure. 
these are rotten dissections. And the rule of seven doesn't just apply to the bones of the orbit, but they apply, there are seven intraorbital muscles, you know them all, superior, the recti and the obliques. And here they are in a dissection. Now, another very important anatomical point uh, that uh, young residents may not always fully appreciate. This is the annulus of Zinn. Not all the nerves go through the annulus of Zinn. The ones that are outside are the so-called LFT, lacrimal branch of V1, F, in the US, it's easy for residents to remember LFT is liver function tests. They order it all the time. So, so that's why we, we use it. LFT, lacrimal branch, frontal branch, and trochlear nerve are outside the annulus of Zinn. The inferior of, and by the way, the superior ophthalmic vein. The inferior ophthalmic vein is also outside the annulus of Zinn. Everything else is inside the annulus of Zinn, which of course, Annulus of Zen is partly on the optic canal and partly on the superior orbit of fissure. It's important to understand how the ophthalmic artery curves. It's not a straight shot as it goes uh, next to and then under the optic nerve, how it leaves the carotid artery. And of course, there are many variations. Uh, it's very, very important, as you will see a little later, why, the, uh, why, it's imp uh, why we need to understand the superior ophthalmic vein and its course, particularly if you are a cerebrovascular or, and or skull-based neurosurgeon. It's very important to understand how the retinal artery feeds the optic nerve from below as a branch of the ophthalmic artery. And of course, the, there are medial branches of the ophthalmic artery. There are lateral branches. The medial ones are anterior and posterior ethmoidal, and the rest you can see here in the picture. Lots of anatomy, but it's really simple anatomy. I know these pictures, maybe for those of you who haven't dissected the orbit or seen it or operate on the orbit, may look so complicated. Trust me, it's nothing as complicated, nowhere close complica as complicated as neural pathways, tracts, nuclei. This is simple anatomy, some basic principles. So then, once you understand this and simple anatomy, you try to relate it to the skull base. So it's important to realize that the bone here, the frontal bone relates to the bulbar area of the orbit. The cribriform bone relates to the retrobulbar area and the planum sphenoidale relates to the orbital apex. So if you think of it in those three segments, it's very easy to, re to relate intraorbital contents to the skull base around it. This is from a paper that listed all the pathologies that you could encounter in the orbit. I'm not going to list them, but you can see. Sorry, Professor Marcus, we can't hear you. You seem disconnected and your screen is fixed, it's freezing. It is disconnected. It is disconnected. 
دكتور فيكي I can't see. I yeah, cannot. he joined so us Hamad. now. Hello, Hamad. I'm yeah. sorry. Professor Marcus joined again. Yes. Yeah, it seems you, you've been disconnected. Yeah, uh, it disconnected back. for a second. Let me see. Let me reconnect right. here. I have, I don't know what happened. Very strange. Um, okay. Right. I was, I think I was. Yeah, here. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I hope it doesn't happen again. You see the slide now? Yeah, okay. sure. Go ahead. Okay. So I was discussing intraconal, extraconal, lateral, central, medial, and very important, the layers between the muscle and the periorbita, or are you outside the periorbita, or are you detach here detaching it? I think we lost you since you were talking about uh, the three different uh, areas of uh, the orbit. Yeah, 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 here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, yeah, this is exactly. it, correct. Yes. And this is a, the, the extra conal and intra conal classification and the yeah. three different areas, I think. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, how do we approach uh, things? So, from above is what the neurosurgeon is mostly familiar with. This is, again, very simple. You only have, you have a medial route between superior oblique and uh, levator palpebri superior rectus complex. So that would be the medial route to the optic nerve, for example. Uh, or a central route, you could split the superior rectus and levator palpebri right here. Or lateral route, you can push superior rectus and levator palpebri medially and look from, lat from laterally. It all depends what your exact target is. So this, this is, I love this picture because you, know, you think of the orbit like a clock and here are you know, the different disciplines that can need to collaborate. Uh, but I, what I want to, to do is just don't, let's not think of us ourselves as neurosurgeons. It means we only know how to come from above cranioorbital. No, we need to understand all the angles. And so we can talk sense with our collaborators, the rhinologist, the head and neck that generally comes from here, the rhinologist coming from here, and of course the oculoplastic surgeon that should be able to handle the entire clock. So lots of orbital approaches. These are, this is some list, small listing of many, many orbital approaches. Of course, many of them were started by orbital surgeons, for example, there are many different ways to go through the lower eyelid, whether you go subciliary non-stepped manner or subciliary stepped manner, or you create a subciliary skin flap, eyebrow, uh, conjunctival, uh, burke cronline extension of the orbitotomy, medial. Uh, this is uh, a list, a table showing the benefits and limitations of the different various approaches transcranial, transorbital, and of course, endonasal endoscopic, endoscopic endonasal, and as you will see in a bit, now the popular endo transorbital endoscopic. Um, the, this is a major transcranial lateral approaches, terrinal, supraorbital, frontoorbital zygomatic. Again, this is basic, but this is what every neurosurgeon, of course, should master, the cranioorbital, approach. I like to do it either interfascial or subfascial. Subfascial may be easier to teach the residents to expose the orbital rim. This is dissections from Roten. Uh, and I like to do the two-piece osteotomy that I remove the bone flap, then I remove. If I'm removing the zygoma, I remove it this way. If I'm not removing the zygoma, it's very rare to need to remove the zygoma itself. I just remove the orbital portion only. And again, an understanding of how, what the keyhole means. Part of it is orbit, part of it is intracranial. This is basic to any neurosurgeon. You understand that osteology, you understand where the optic strut is at the base of the anterior clinoid. And that's the frontotemporal dural fold. And that's a Hakuba dulling peeling of the cavernous sinus if we want to unlock the superior orbital fissure and cut the frontotemporal dural fold to do a clinoidectomy if necessary. Many years ago, 
when I was, you know, I realized I'm teaching my resident, they had difficulty understanding the 3D understanding of this area. So we wrote this little paper saying to modify the dolling technique of how you peel, uh, how you expose the cavernous sinus and the orbital apex. Dolling described at this step cutting the dura here. I find it much easier, particularly to teach the residents to peel, to switch the steps. You peel the outer layer of the cavernous sinus first. You see the tip of the anterior clinoid from the middle fossa right here. Then you can uh, cut the frontotemporal bural fold. That's how I normally do it when I do a transcavernous approach like that. And then you cut the fold. It's easier to understand because the hesitation among young people is they're worried by using the scissors, are they gonna cut the contents of the superior orbit of fissure and cut all the nerves? But obviously it's very difficult to do that, but this will give you assurance that you know exactly where the superior orbit of fissure is before you cut that frontotemporal dural fold. And of course, this is after during the anterior clinoid. Of course, this is a clinoidal segment of the carotid artery. The optic strut has been resected. This is optic nerve. Uh, this is third nerve, fourth nerve. You can see the fourth nerve crossing over the third nerve at the superior orbit of fissure. So let's go through some uh, a case examples. I'm going to show you an orbitocavernous schwannoma. You can see her eye protruding, limited excursion of the eye superiorly, limited inferiorly, limited laterally because she has this large lesion, which you will see, it's a schwannoma. It's partly in the cavernous sinus and mostly in the orbit. So what approach, uh, I'm so, I, I forgot to add the other slices of the MRI that actually shows you more the cavernous sinus component. So it's uh, going through the superior orbit of fissure. So I'm gonna do a cranioorbital approach I like to do extradural clinoidectomy on all tumors. I only do intradural clinoidectomy on aneurysms, but otherwise extradural is so much cleaner. Now here, after I've entered the orbit, I am removing the orbital portion of the schwannoma. You debulk it, that's kind of the easier part. Now I go to do the Dolling hakuba peeling, of the cavernous sinus lateral wall because I still have tumor inside the cavernous sinus communicating through the superior orbit of fissure with the orbital portion. So now we're talking cavernous sinus surgery. I like to peel it with the four pen field or I use an instrument called the freer sometimes. And those of you, again, who haven't done too many of these, it's very, it's very, important like Dolling described to find V2 at foramen rotundum right here, then move to the superior orbit of fissure and V1. Then you have to do monitoring. Here we are putting tissue sealant. You have to monitor and maps with a stimulator, with a NIM stimulator to find out where the nerves are. So now I'm opening the cavernous sinus in an area where, you can see it bulging, in an area where I believe there are no nerves. And then as you will see, we will find the tumor and I'm gonna be working, here is V1, I'm lateral to V1, <clears throat> V1 and V2, and it's a schwannoma, it's not a meningioma, so it's, it's much easier as you all know, much easier to remove almost as one piece, the use of traction and counter traction to put uh, tissue sealant or surgery cell or powder gel foam, use that as counter-traction. You can see the use of my sucker in an atraumatic way. It has a nice non-sharp edge to it. Here is the carotid artery in the cavernous sinus. You see it right, right there. And the tumor comes out so nicely when it's a schwannoma. I wish meningiomas behaved like this, but they don't usually, but schwannomas do mostly. And peeling it off the cavernous sinus and this way, I am sure I removed everything. And if I wasn't sure what you could do, you could put an instrument from the orbit right here 
to the cavernous sinus through the superior orbital fissure to make sure you haven't missed any tumor in between. You see here, I'm fishing, making sure, see there is a little piece of tumor, I'm gonna be getting that. So that's how, when you do, when you understand orbital anatomy, you can do these cases with much more ease and safety. And this is a nice view of the cavernous sinus. There is V1 at the end, not much bleeding because of course you have to use tissue sealant or, or uh, powder gel form. You see now the use of the instrument to make sure I can see the tip of it from the orbit between the orbital muscles. Uh, and the, and I, you can go also the other way. And that's a post-op MRI, it's gross total resection. I want to show you another case, uh, illustrating uh, a, sim a simpler case. This is Dr. Jacques Morcos from the University of Miami, Department of Neurosurgery. This is a dermoid. Uh, you have all seen dermoid tumors. Look at his eye, limited. He has partial ophthalmoparesis with a third nerve palsy. Why? Because he has a... Hypo. Oh, sorry, let me show you the lesion. I'm sorry. Here we go. Here, you see the lesion, classic dermoid with fat signal in it. And we're going to do this. Reach. We can skip all that. Muscle at the and we are going to do a cavernous. The, wall of the cavernous sinus. And in this case, since the video is narrated, that's why there are two voices. The lobe dura. Doling, Hakuba, uh, peeling. A variety of instruments can be used. Of the lateral Sometimes wall of the cavernous use, uh, sinus. Four, number four pen field, number one pen field, or a freer. Here is, here is, a, look, you will the, see it's like pus, but of course it's dermoid. To and you empty it and the, you will see a piece of hair. You see hair the from the dermoid. The dermoid. And then same as the last people. case, you map the nerves, you save them, and you remove the capsule all the way to the Again. cavernous. A very carotid gentle artery. manipulation of the contents and of the inner layer of here is a is doppler the being used on the carotid artery the very carotid. nice view of the artery and the doppler use and we use the mesh in this case and here he is post op and i believe the mri uh, the third nerve was exactly the same it was no worse and I guess I forgot the MRI or maybe it's, oh, anyway, the, it's a gross total resection. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are many transorbital endoscopic studies. Uh, and and uh, Chris Moore, for example, in Washington helped pioneer that 10 years ago, uh, using the endoscope through the orbit, through a variety, uh, and the same way, a variety of uh, techniques. Um, I don't have time to cover this today, but, uh, <clears throat> The same way we divide the different types of approaches from above and lateral, you can do the same with the transorbital approaches. Uh, now, I want to warn you that transorbital approaches are nice, but you cannot achieve a very radical resection of lesions. This is from a paper uh, from a New York group going for this fibrous uh, uh, hyperostosis, sorry, in an in a intraosseous meningioma. They use the transorbital approach to do a partial resection. You can certainly do that with a transorbital approach with an endoscope. But of course, there is lots of you know residual. But the goal was only a partial resection. Then you can certainly do it. Uh, you can do various eyelid uh, procedures. And of course, it helps to have a world, I mean, uh, you know, expert oculoplastic surgeons working with you uh, as a neurosurgeon. So let's go through some cases. Um, uh, this is a patient with gradual decline of visual acuity on the left eye. Here is a lesion at the orbital apex. It's medial to the optic nerve. See it again? It's medial to the optic nerve uh, and it's high on T2. So this is a classic uh, cavernoma and it's medial to the optic nerve. Now, in the old days, before the advent of endoscopic endonasal surgery, I would have done this case through a superior approach, uh, cranioorbital. But it's not necessary. It's much better um, 
uh, to go endonasal endoscopic since it's medial to the optic nerve. Uh, this is actually a video of another case because it's a nicer quality video. So again, of course, and I do endonasal surgery with my rhinologists. And here we are opening the right uh, medial periorbita. I like to coagulate the orbital fat. Here is medial rectus. And here I am looking for the classic cavernoma in the orbital apex, intraconal, medial to the optic nerve. All you need to do is find it. Once you find it, keep it as one piece. So uh, you have to push away the fat. And of course, that's why you need two hands. There it is, you see? Uh, that's why your, the ENT surgeon need to navigate the endoscope for you. Once you grab it, don't let go of it and work around it. Don't cut into it or you will miss it. You will miss a piece that will uh, retract back into the orbital fat. It will be harder to find. So be patient and work with it. And then uh, uh, very in the orbit, one basic principle, if you have, and here it is coming out, if you have a small artery, coagulate it and cut it very well. Don't let it retract into the orbit or you will have an orbital hematoma post-op. This is a simple operation. Patient goes home the same day. Uh, it's, it's sinus surgery. It's not really neurosurgery per se. We like to use alloderm to help reconstruct cranial nerve, uh, I mean, skull-based defect, dural defect, or periorbita. Uh, that's alloderm being used by my ENT rhinology colleague. Um, and that's a post-op, uh, it's complete resection, as, as you'd expect. Uh, another orbital apex schwannoma, uh, I'm not another, this is an orbital apex schwannoma, like I just showed you, a cavernoma. They can look the same. Uh, the, the T2 is high in both. Of course, the cavernoma has that stippled appearance. Again, it's medial to the orbit. So that is, it would be wrong or unnecessary to do a cranioorbital approach if you know how to do endonasal endoscopic surgery. That's, in these cases, for sure the best approach. Patients go home the same day. You don't open the skull per se. Here we are on the left side this time. And I want to show you for comparison. Here I am pushing the medial rectus down. You see how different they look? This is a schwannoma. I had just shown you a cavernoma before. Uh, schwannoma, typical appearance. Same thing. What you want to do is, oh, I pulled it already. Let me see. Here we go. I just want to show you that step. You're pulling it, pulling it, pulling it. Try to keep it one piece. And it comes out one piece. When you see that, you know you got it all. But of course, you still need to inspect, make sure there are no residual uh, after this resection. Uh, and that's alloderm. And oh no, I'm sorry, in this case, we used a mucosal, free mucosal flap. And I think there is alloderm, and this is mericel packing. Uh, okay, I want to show you an unusual, but a very essential role of the neurosurgeon in the orbit. Uh, in spite of the advances of endovascular, sometimes carotid cavernous fistula cannot be accessed endovascularly. I'll, I'll show you what I mean, and I'm sure those of you who deal with these lesions know that uh, sometimes the endovascular uh, uh, neurosurgeon or neuroradiologist cannot, to treat a CC fistula, need to go endovenously. They sometimes <laughs> cannot navigate through the inferior petrosal sinus and the only drainage is a superior ophthalmic vein, or they cannot puncture percutaneously the angular vein on the face, you may be called as a neurosurgeon to uh, uh, identify the superior ophthalmic vein in the inner canthus uh, to cannulate it. That's often, not often, sometimes the only way to cure these fistulae that can cause blindness. So I many years ago, I published my Ten, first 10 cases doing this. Here is a superior ophthalmic vein. So all of these are cases that failed endovascular attempt by my partners who are very skilled. Uh, I'm going to spare you the details. How That's how we do it. We make an I like to make an incision. I actually do these cases without our oculoplastic 
colleagues because they're not you know too versed in they're not very well versed in vascular arterial lesions of the orbit so so but of certainly if you have an oculoplastic surgeon who has an interest in this specific case uh, you should use their expertise um, here is me finding the vein and then putting a cannula a cook four french cook uh, system you you all you have to do is provide access then you go to the angel suite and then your endovascular person can use that access to put coils or onyx or whatever they wish to use that's how you cure these fistulae and you can see the vein is pretty big you can use a cta or a ctv pre-op if you want to make sure you see exactly where the vein is you can use doppler but it's it's really simple it's it's a glorified venous cut down that again neurosurgeons should know how to do if there isn't an orbital surgeon who can do this and um, I, I had nine out of ten cures uh, not nine out of ten of that series completely cured and one was only partially cured because the vein was very small uh, just I, I sh I'll show you part of this video how it is sped up here is a vein you see you recognize it you need to learn how to use these cotton swabs this is a trick I learned from the orbital oculoplastic surgeon to push the fat away and then you put you know as I showed you silk tie around it to lift it and then you puncture it with that cook system and the rest is as I showed you very easy a, uh, not all orbital lumps are tumors um, show you this patient 18 year old he goes to a plastic surgeon to fix his swollen eyelid look at it from the side the plastic surgeon luckily he's a very skilled plastic surgeon cuts the skin does not puncture this massive arterialized vein i don't know how he managed to not injure it but these are pictures from that plastic surgeon uh, and he of course he closed and sent the patient to me and what this patient had is an avm that had an unusual venous drainage uh, i'll show you it drained here is the avm a huge amount of flow with steel phenomenon look at the venous drainage right here from all the way parietal going to the sylvian system to the sphenoparietal sinus into the orbital huge superior uh, ophthalmic vein very unusual for an avm that far back anyway i'm not going to show you but obviously i removed the avm and uh, obviously that was the necessary thing to do and then the the venous uh, problem in the eye took care of itself not all lesions intrinsic to the optic nerve are inoperable uh, so let me show you this relatively recent case i'll skip through some of the history but she presented with decreased vision for two days to my uh, uh, oculo uh, to my neuroophthalmology colleagues here at the university of miami we have a very famous hospital the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. These are my collaborators. Uh, they are actually voted number one in the US for 17 years in a row. The eye hospital we have here as part of University of Miami. So I'm putting a plug for them, although they don't need me to plug that, but they're spectacular. So here is her initial visual acuity in the right eye and the diffuse pallor. And look at the lesion. You might think this is an optic chiasmal glioma and you might say it's inoperable but that would be a mistake i want that's why i'm showing the case because first of all it turned out not to be a glioma the acuteness of the presentation forces me to operate uh, and i am glad i did and this is a differential and here it is at surgery and this is look at that beautiful view of a cavernoma of the optic nerve and those are this is a sped up video and they are absolutely resectable always i have done several of these in the optic pathway uh, I, I heard recently bill caldwell my friend from utah has a similar experience 
and you 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 know carefully dissect them off the remaining intact optic nerve not intact but the remaining fibers of the optic nerve uh, and here it is very sharp dissection and look at the view we have at the end here is the lesion now what's left looks very healthy isn't it even though it's like a hole in the optic nerve and this patient amazingly this is a cavernoma amazingly improved look at her vision post op you would say i was sure she's going to wake up blind this is 2030 from 2300 within several days of the surgery this is a visual field pre op and post op this is optic nerve photos oct dramatic improvement actually we just published it with my uh, baskin palmer colleagues uh, so please don't you know don't assume that if it's in the optic nerve or optic chasm is not operable uh, so what are lessons i have learned from orbital surgery over the years uh, some of them here inadequate tumor resections around the sphenoid or orbit are very common i'm sure you see it too uh, neurosurgeons let's say who remove a sphenoorbital meningioma remove only the soft part and they leave all the invaded bone of the lateral wall of the orbit because of I mean, unfamiliarity with orbital anatomy. Well, that's the easiest part of the tumor to remove. It's in bone. You should definitely be very radical with that, like you, you are with chordomas. So, or drilling the anterior clinoid, I, I, I'm sorry, I've learned the lesson that you must drill the anterior clinoid for all clinoidal and tuberculum cell meningiomas and all orbital apex lesions. Sam Al Mafti is absolutely right. Many times you find meningiomas hiding in the optic nerve sheet that even the MRI didn't show you. That's number one. Number two, it's a matter of safety, exposure, and allowing the optic nerve to move freely while you're wor working on the tumor. If you don't drill the anterior clinoid, uh, it's, it, it, the outcomes are worse as also Dr. Teet Mattison had shown many years ago in a paper on vision. Vision is better if you decompress the optic nerve before you attack the tumor. Uh, another lesson I, I learned, of course, is not to be neurosurgeon-centric, meaning the orbit is really 360 degree and you need to learn how to operate from many angles. So I'll, go, I'll keep going through some other cases. 39-year-old female with proptosis, pain in her eye. What do you think this lesion is? This is on CT, is heavily calcified. This is a juvenile active ossifying fibroma, JAOF. We removed it endonasally, endoscopically, three years ago. Uh, radically, but not radical enough. We left a small piece right here. And sure enough, it grew back. This piece grew back. These are benign but locally aggressive. You have to be very radical with their resection. Here it is, three and a half years post op, uh, have grown back. We, we took her back. We did it also endonasally a few months ago. And this time we were much more radical with the roof of the orbit. As you know, endonasally, you can reach the midpoint, the mid coronal level of the roof of the orbit. That's what we did in this case. And I'm pretty sure this time she is cured, but we have to wait for long-term follow-up. Next case is a 67-year-old female, several years of decreased visual acuity, proptosis. She only has hand motion in the left eye. Unfortunately, she let herself go too long without seeing the doctor look at the large dumbbell tumor similar to the earlier case I showed you. Then I did a modified, again, same thing, cranioorbital approach, Dolling, Hakuba, transcavernous, transorbital, and removed the orbit, I mean the tumor completely. That's another lesson I learned, by the way. I do not replace orbital roof anymore. Again, Bill Caldwell and I have given lectures on this many times. He and I agree. Uh, if you replace with mesh or something, the proptosis does not get better. So I don't replace the orbit roof or lateral wall at all. Of course, I replace the skull uh, with mesh or something if necessary. 
but leave the, peri or the, the, the orbit free and it will reposition itself in most cases. Uh, another case, gradual decrease vision on the left eye, full eye movements. This is, of course, a medial sphenoid wing meningioma. You absolutely must drill the clinoid, otherwise you will miss uh, the part that is in the optic canal. And I achieved, in this case, a Simpson grade one through a modified cranio orbital. By the way, anytime I say modified cranio orbital, I don't remove the orbital rim. It's, absolute, it's not necessary in these cases to remove orbital rim. What you have to remove is the posterior roof of the orbit and the posterior lateral wall, unlock the superior orbital fissure, but it's totally unnecessary to remove the rim and add steps to the surgery. I only remove the rim if the lesion is huge and is very high above the skull base and you want to look up. Another case, 42-year-old female, numbness, V1, V2, blurry vision, and she has this. Again, I want to remind you, this is a middle third sphenoid wing meningioma, and I've seen too many of these cases where the uh, maybe outside community neurosurgeon removes only this part and they don't drill any of this bone that is filled with intraosseous tumor. And these, of course, these patients recur. So you have to, to do it, uh, to resect it aggressively. And if there is a portion in the cavernous sinus and the patient does not have ophthalmoplegia or ophthalmoparesis pre-op and the tumor is not soft, and then, of course, it's reasonable to leave a small residual to do gamma knife on. But you have to try to remove everything if you can. I'll show you another case of a purely intraosseous sphenoid wing meningioma. Same thing, radical resection, mesh cranioplasty. And uh, that's it. I'm going to stop here. I went fast to make sure I had... Uh, uh, I left time for questions. I took away some slides of other pathology. <clears throat> and uh, again, I remind you, uh, you know, if you'd like to visit and participate uh, in our other webinars, here is the link. So I encourage you to be a neurosurgeon who understands the orbital anatomy, because as you can see, there are many, many pathologies that you can contribute to as a neurosurgeon. And thank you very okay. much for your invitation. Thank you, Hello. Professor Jack, for this uh, wonderful presentation. About, can I? Uh, can I? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, about this uh, wonderful presentation about this uh, uh, relatively um, uh, missing part in the practice of neurosurgery. Not all neurosurgeons practice orbital kind of tumors. Uh, Can we, I ask uh, we'll question, open please? The questions to the panel. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, please yes. go ahead. Yes. Professor uh, Samal Ghanem, uh, thank you for <laughs> contribution and uh, we are very happy that uh, you are. Yes, uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I must thank uh, Jack. Uh, I haven't seen him years since we met in Boston years ago. Uh, for his uh, uh, meeting. And uh, I have a humble experience uh, more than 40 years uh, wo working on the orbit. And I learned a very different technique from what you said, which you can reach all locations of the orbit. Uh, this, I've learned that from uh, Jason Bryce in Southampton in England in 1980. And uh, he wasn't, um, keen on uh, using the operating microscope, but myself, I always use it. What we do is we do three bare holes. One at the, bit, at the um, uh, lower frontal, and one uh, in the lateral wall of the orbit, and one into the anterior part of the temporal bone. And then we connect the three balls together, removing all the, the roof of the orbit, and we're removing all the lateral orbit and even part of the inferior orbit. So there's nothing orbital. We keep the orbital ring for cosmetic appearance and no worry at all about uh, 
being uh, pulsating with psalmos, so long you are having intact dura matter. We don't replace the roof of the orbit or the lateral of the orbit. And by doing that, uh, when you take the bone, you see three balls together, the tip of the temporal lobe and the uh, inferior surface uh, of frontal lobe and the whole orbit in front of you. And once you open the uh, densin capsule of the orbit, you are exposed. You can take medial location at the apex of the orbit. Uh, you can reach um, wherever the location, intracoronal, extracoronal, what is it, anything. I know I'm, uh, since the time of Nafziga, they have the uh, scared, but uh, I'm, I'm assured now and happy that you said you don't do any more uh, replacement of the um, uh, superior roof of the orbit. Uh, but my comment is most of your work is uh, from the dermoid and the meningioma. The, um, most of them they are not in the orbit. In fact, you have medial sphenoid wing meningioma, you have a dermoid. So I think you featured only two cases. And you know, most of the cases in the orbit, either neurofibroma or capillary hemangioma. Um, then, then our um, optic nerve glioma. I didn't come across with any cavernous um, cavernoma of the optic nerve. I see um, meningioma on the orbit coming from the uh, or optic nerve sheath. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Jack, are you going to do any comment for uh, for uh, Professor Samal Ghanem? Oh yeah, well no, I mean I agree with some of the things he said because of time. Of course, I couldn't show all everything. Of course, we have all the types of pathologies in the orbit, uh, but I just wanted to bring it close to the neurosurgical expertise. That's why I showed a lot of the sphenoorbital meningioma because statistically, yeah. of course, that's what we mostly see and i want to bring the point home that we need to be aggressive and enter the orbit and not be afraid of the orbit and the main point to say is that endonasal endoscopic has revolutionized those old approaches that you you mentioned and we all still use but we need to learn how to use the less invasive ones when it is appropriate um yeah yes but why should i do um I mean, why should I do approach uh, with the hazard of CSF fleet uh, and time? Uh, when we do this lateral orbitectomy, not orbitotomy, as we, they called in the past, it's orbitectomy. We remove the bone of the orbit. We don't, we don't have orbit except orbit. I mean, we don't do craniotomy. It's just very little, small incision, and you have the whole orbit in front of you. That's what really I meant to say. Yeah, but, but how, how are you going to deal with the lesion that is medial to the optic nerve, as I, I oh, showed two lesions? <laughs> you see, you can pu pu push the dura, you, you have no roof of the orbit now, you can go anywhere, medial, anterior, posterior, inferior, <laughs> you, that's no, what no, I'm of doing. Course. Of course, but, but if it can be done in a less, in, and you're talking to a very aggressive surgeon, myself, well, <laughs> you know, I do. So if you can do it in a lesser probably. way that sends the patient home the same day, why not, why not do it and do it easily? And that's, well, that's well, my message. Well, in, in, all, in what I'm doing that, the patient usually goes on the second day, but we keep closing uh, the, or the eye and it's terrible because sometimes you have edema. So you have to compress the eye and he goes yeah. on the second day. Just between you, mind you that I'm very aggressive surgeon as well. You can ask right. about that. <laughs> no, I know you are, but, but we, all, we all need to stay open-minded. That's all I'm saying. Okay. If, 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 no if, an, if an old dog like me can learn new tricks, all of those young people <laughs> listening to us certainly should. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Mohammed, uh, I think you have more questions from Professor Jack and Professor Alfei.
Hamad, uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Yeah, good. So we have a couple of questions here for uh, Professor Marcos, and uh, the, the, uh, they are uh, asking about using the ultrasound in, in detecting tumors of the orbit intraoperatively. And uh, how liberal, uh, liberal you are in using the bipolar during resection of such tumors? Yeah, uh, ultrasound. We I, I use yeah. navigation, of course, on all uh -huh. these cases. If navigation fails, then ultrasound is is certainly useful. Very, I mean, you know, particularly in the orbit, we actually. Here at, at the Eye Institute, they pioneered some special uh, outpatient ultrasound machine technology to study very detailed, uh, but it's not available intra-op per se. It's, it's rarely, I mean, if you're lost or something, or there's been a shift in the orbital contents and navigation is not accurate, and you're looking for a very small lesion, you can bring in the ultrasound and look for it. Uh, bipolaring, very low current. I bipolar the orbital fat all the time. Of course, you have to be careful near the optic nerve. You have to be careful near the other nerves as well. And, and, and what's very surprising, I don't know about you and your colleagues, oculoplastic surgeons in Egypt, but ours don't use the microscope. So when I collaborate with them, I'm in the orbit under the microscope. And if they're doing their part, they take the microscope away. They put their high power loop. And that's yeah. how they work. That's how they're trained. It's it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, we, we, we get them involved with most of the time. Would, would you uh, uh, follow the same approach with the ocular plastics? And oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, most, I mean, most of the orbital tumors are referred by them to me yeah. to collaborate together. That's how we do it. Right. So um, in, in, you've mentioned some cases where you peel the uh, lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and you have your own modification to teach the residents. Uh, but we find that uh, uh, going through the lateral part of the uh, anterior clinoid and uh, uh, starting to uh, see the dural fold will make it easy for us to identify the the actual or the appropriate dural plane in order to peel the 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 cavernous sinus dura uh, from anterior to posterior, would you, would you have uh, special tricks in in identifying the appropriate plane before start peeling it? Well, no, no, I, uh, going back to that those few slides I mentioned. It's really not meant for the experienced surgeon. The experienced surgeon should do what Dolink described. Oh, right. so you, you, you cut the frontotemporal dural fold. You know, you and I and others who do this all the time, it's not an issue. But I found that my residents, early, young residents, did not have a 3D understanding yet of this anatomy. So I found that the trick is to go to V2, find V2 first peel towards the superior orbital fissure. Then I could show them what the frontotemporal dural fold looks like and in what direction you cut it. That's why Dolink used a curved met scissors pointing backwards because yeah. that's how you want to avoid injury to the SOF. Right. Uh, we, I, I personally use the, uh, the, the uh, nerve monitoring 346 just to map the the, uh, the, the nerves before I choose a bare, bare area uh, to, to, to open the, through the cavernous sinus. Would you take the same approach or how, how do you use the, mm -hmm. the monitoring in these particular cases? Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly what I showed in one of the cases. You, you know, it's video that's edited. So yeah, you take the NIM stimulator when particularly you cannot see through the transparency of the dura where V1 is, uh, you, uh, you absolutely map it and choose that way, yes. Right, and in cases where there is uh, intracavernous kind of extension, especially in cases of uh, meningiomas, uh, uh, what's your view about this? Would, would you be so aggressive in taking these tumors out or you just 
leave part for radio surgery. You mean in the cavernous sinus? Yeah. Yeah. No, generally, as I mentioned. If it is meningioma. Uh, there are many. I'm going to quote Sam El Mefti. Some meningiomas are angels, some are devils. Um, right. The devil ones, I don't chase them in the cavernous sinus if the patient has normal vision. Uh, uh, no, I mean, normal eye movements. Um, it, if they're already ophthalmoparetic or it's a recurrent, then I have many cases. That's another talk on cavernous sinus exenteration, whether you do it partial, not partial. And that's a whole different topic. In general, yeah. I leave meningiomas for radio surgery uh, if the patient has normal eye movements. Right. Okay. And you've mentioned that uh, while dreading the uh, anterior clinoid, obviously we have to take the, uh, the connection, which is the, the optic strut before you, you remove it. Would you uh, open the falciform ligament and make sure that the optic nerve is mobile before you attempt uh, 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 chasing the tumor? Exactly right. Yes, absolutely. The key step after you do the clinoidectomy, combine extra and intradural opening of falciform ligament, visualize that the optic nerve is movable, then I attack the tumor. Right. Uh, there is a question from one of the uh, participants about the use of the cryoprobe in removing uh, tumors from the orbit. I, I have not personally used it. What I have used in the orbit and the brain and some skull base cases and some, I don't do any spine work, uh, but uh, is an OmniGuide CO2 laser that shrinks, particularly it's perfect for lipomas, not on the orbit, but like spinal cord, you know, lipomas uh, or fibrous meningiomas, uh, uh, the CO2 OmniGuide laser. I have no experience with the cryoprobe. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question for Professor al uh, about the, uh, the one of the uh, slides that you showed. This was a relatively unilateral kind of uh, uh, involvement. Uh, uh, would you would you agree this could be a chondrosarcoma rather than a chordoma? And would you consider doing a multi-stage procedure? and bypass techniques before you, you go in and try to remove such lesions. Muhammad, you're muted. You are muted. You're muted, uh, Professor Fiqhi. Uh, uh, yeah. So that's so, the I'm not discussing. Uh, as regards to staging, I do staging uh, so many times. So it's, it's better to stage the patient than to uh, mutilate him. So that's the principle. Right. Uh, for Professor Marcos, uh, I, I always take a view that uh, chordomas, that's very extensive. Um, uh, these are tumors that is going to kill the, the, the patient. Uh, and I have to be very aggressive with it. And uh, I do every possible exposure, even on the stages to remove such lesions. Uh, would, you, would you consider uh, doing uh, transbasal skull base approaches, endoscopic approaches to remove these tumors? And would you consider doing bypass in cases of unilateral chondrosarcomas invading into the cavernous sinus? Yeah, I've, I've done that. It's not very common. I've done that. Uh, I have, you know, large experience of bypasses for other things, aneurysms and stuff. But uh, where I've used bypasses mostly are re multiply recurrent uh, meningiomas, particularly the WHO grade two in the cavernous sinus. I've used it on a few patients with fungal infections of the skull base. Here in Miami, we, we get sometimes aspergillus and mucormycosis, you know, from uh, various regions around us. Uh, um, uh, chordoma, I don't remember a specific bypass for a chordoma, but uh, chondrosarcoma, I've done it laterally a few times, yes. Yeah, good. Uh, by the way, uh, you mentioned the grade two uh, meningiomas invading into the cavernous sinus. <laughs> we have come to recent publications uh, 
saying that uh, after radio surgery, there has been a change in the behavior of such lesions and they became very aggressive. Have you had similar experience in your practice? Yeah. Yes, um, not just me, many. We were actually on a Zoom, Zoom webinar the other day, somebody mentioning data about this. Now, you know, it's, it's very hard to entirely, you know, I mean, how do you prove that it was the yeah. radio surgery that did it? To how do you prove it's not a new mutation? Is a mutation due to radio? Very hard to prove, but certainly co uh, we've all had that experience, that curve that starts linear in growth rate and then takes off. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is uh, uh, we we we're, we're a bit uh, uh, short of time here, and we, we uh, would like to thank you, Professor Morcos, for your time, and Professor Fiki, and I would like Professor Randur to uh, uh, give a final talk. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you thank very you, much. Mohammed, for this uh, excellent moderation of this session. It was a great session. At the end of this session, I would like to thank our speakers, my friend, Professor Jack Moros. Thank you for honoring us by your contribution to our webinar and looking forward to more contribution in another webinar soon. Thanks to my friend, Professor Mohammed al fei for contribution to this webinar. I would like to thank all participants. Let me just uh, make an announcement. We have three speakers, uh, new new speakers. Michael Lawton is going to be in our webinar 28th August. Professor Joha Hernes Nimi is going to be our guest in 11th September. Professor Osama Al Mufti will uh, make a session about acoustic neuroma in 30 October. Next webinar, uh, next Friday, will be we will have Jenkin Alistar. He is the president-elect of the British Society of Neurosurgery, Professor Khaled Al-Bahi as the speakers, and the moderator will be Professor Khaled Basim. Thanks to all of you for cooperation, for contribution, and for this great webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Nasir. Mohammed Al-Fiki, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dr. Nasr. Nam? Nasr, Doctor. Merci.